reports, I talked about new markets, I, pro I talked about uh, projections and goals, I talked about the Minnesota-Wisconsin series. You remember I, I used to say she went up today, butter went up, cheese went up, because we were doing something. It's been going up pretty regularly and it hasn't been uh, something that you haven't been involved in. I talked about supply contracts years ago in Minnesota where every three months uh, we called the Minnesota producers together who were participating in that program and issued an, an additional check. Remember that, Minnesota? Remember Wisconsin uh, people where uh, they tried to stop us? They said we couldn't do that, that this was illegal, it was a two-price system. And all the while we were going on in these programs, our one goal, of course, was to raise the overall price of milk to farmers all over the nation. So there has to be questions in your mind today. How successful have you been? I can say that we don't need any major breakthroughs in contracts or markets or acceptance or big changes in the dairy program. It simply means that we need more volume, which Orrin Lee Staley has said about our, all our commodities. I talked to a lady out here today, she's got, a, or yesterday, a very sincere problem. She said, why is our price at this price and somebody else is so close by higher? It's just volume, that's all it is, but let's take a look at what we've done. <clears throat> you know, your farmers are begging for what you people have to offer. We say we want three out of ten farmers to become members of this organization and put their production together. The polls say that seven out of ten want what you're offering. But to be very factual, at least 99 out of 100 want what you're, you're offering. Occasionally you will hear somebody say, well, milk is high enough, or meat is high enough, but I'll tell you, he's rare. You can go back over his circumstances and find out that you could prove him wrong, but you don't win a lot of friends and influence people that way. People today are spending millions going to Washington to try and get something done. They're deeper in debt than they've ever been in history. Professor Braemeyer of this state said recently, you've had American agriculture and the family type farming for 202 years. You maybe got 12 years left. Maybe. Academic leaders are now saying that the National Farmers Organization is doing it right. They're getting at the root of the problem. There are many farmers that don't know this, and the sad thing is that many of our own members really don't know it. If they did, there wouldn't be a person in this room today that produces dairy that wouldn't have his milk with the National Farmers Organization program, or his meat, or his grain. They really don't know the impact that you have as an individual coming with this organization. The problem isn't with the programs. Our real problem is you have not had the tools and the confidence yet to really go out and smile and say, you've got to come with us. We can touch that victory. It's that close. Yet, it's true. You can touch it. You can have it. But you've got to know what you've done. Hasn't been easy to get here. You know, we could have got here easy. Ten years ago, a man from the dairy industry met me in Des Moines. He said, why don't you come with us? He said, we tried to do what you're doing 20 years ago and it didn't work. Of course it didn't work 20 years ago. No communication system like we got today. Hundreds of thousands of more people to talk to. Today we got top farmers, big farmers, educated farmers, and farmers that are going to do business like the rest of the world. So at that point, it's been, it was tough. I don't think there's anybody in this room that feels that you're not right in your objectives. I don't think there's anybody in this room from Wisconsin who participated in the meetings when we said we'd stop the drop. Remember, Basil? I'm talking to people from Wisconsin. 484 farmers 
met one day and began to put their power together and it embarrassed everyone in Washington, D.C. It almost scares me, the power that farmers have, if they just use a little bit of it. The Farm Journal reported, everybody was embarrassed. They didn't predict it. We predicted it. We went on the radio ahead of time and told them we were going to do it, didn't we? And the proof was there. You know how you helped raise the series price. You sure know how you fought IRS, SEC, and those who brought lawsuits against you. You fought them, you're winning, you've won and you're winning. The sad part of it is they left so few of you to carry the load, and that was the tough part of it, but in talking to the people around the convention, I think you feel kind of proud today that you've carried that load, don't you? You've carried it for the American farmer across the whole nation. And here you are together. Sad thing is, many weren't strong enough. Some of them weren't strong enough, and I felt sorry for a young Wisconsin farmer this morning who called me. And he says, I'm taking my milk off the truck. That's not a good report to give you, is it? But it's factual. And I said, all right, what's the problem? He says, because I want the regulations changed where the, the Board of Health can't come on my farm and make an inspection when I'm not home. Well, I said, really, what does that have to do with collective bargaining? He says, nothing, but I want something done on it. I said, look, I don't care if they come on my farm and leave a note that I have to put bathroom tile all over my barn the next day. And if I have to do it, and I'll put it in the next contract that the consumer is going to pay for it. And that's why you're here, and that's the way we get things done. I hope he keeps his milk on the truck. It was a lot longer conversation than that, but that was it. So when we get these other objectives and think about the other things, we've kind of lost confidence in what we're really out here to do. You know, I talked about the butterfat ripoff a year ago and it hit the Associated Press and boy, did I catch it. I, catch, I caught it from the Department of Agriculture in Washington, D.C. to the plant managers to even producers said it can't be happening, it can't be that bad. Let me tell you how bad it is. We had beliefs and evidence last year, but no convictions. This year there's convictions on exactly what we talked about. The ironic thing about it, when that statement hit the press and processors, and I might say unethical un, uh, processors, read that, one of them had the nerve to call one of our dairy offices and threaten to bring a lawsuit if we didn't stop making some of those awful misleading statements. In a quick summary, let me tell you that that same processor that made that call has been caught on cheating on butterfat tests, has had to pay, make restitution to his producers, has lost his license, got a hundred dollar fine. The same man. I'm not going to mention the man, I'm not going to dwell on that, but I do know that there was more to it than that. I wanted to compliment the Department of Agriculture in Wisconsin. I called the man who I thought was responsible. You know, anybody likes a compliment, don't you, don't I, don't she, all of us do. I didn't know the man, but I said, I want to compliment you. You're doing something on behalf of farmers. And then that conversation leads on quite a bit. You start talking frank. And he told me his problems. He said, we're undermanned, we're understaffed, don't have enough money. But he said, that's the only one we went to the press with. I said, you mean there's more? Yeah, there's 15 more on probation. Fifteen more on probation? How many checks did you make? Sixty. Do you know that that's 25 percent of all the buyers and they found things wrong with 25 percent that ought to be corrected? It made me feel kind of good. I feel good and I compliment those people who will take action and try and protect the farmer. But maybe it took somebody to push it and get it done. I bet we got some Idaho producers in here today. 
I bet I want to tell you that some of the people from Idaho says it's the same thing out here, only maybe worse. He said, we moved our supply of production. And the guy from where they moved it says, well, probably won't do you any good. The same thing's going to happen to you over there. That wasn't even bad enough as it reported to me. It was an official who made a statement that he says, my hands are tied. Now, isn't that a sad situation? Am I right in what I'm quoting, Idaho? There's some people from Idaho here. Are any of you dairymen here that reported that to me? There were five of them. Sad situation. That still isn't collective bargaining. You want to know what you did on price. Let me show you. I had hoped that one of four people would be here today. They're not, but they're represented from the county, and it's Monroe County, Wisconsin. Because it would have been Clayton Hansen, Gene Bernstead, My Milo Krieger, and myself, and I'd have said, stand up now. I want to tell these people about something that you and I talked about several years ago. We were all dairy farmers within a close area. And we had been getting the report from the dairy leaders many years ago. We were Wisconsin dairy farmers, and we really couldn't ever get much increase in the price of our milk till many more of these farmers left. There was just too much milk. It wasn't the number of farmers. It was too much milk. Well, our milk supply in Wisconsin hasn't been dwindling. It's just the farmer that's been dwindling. And we often heard, without really knowing, that California was doing a lot better than we were. They talked about $6 a hundred milk in California, milk to go in the bottle. We were scratching to get four. Bob Mankey, who's sitting right here, I said, Bob, what were you getting? I believe Bob told me, he said, my milk was going direct into Chicago and it was less than four dollars, class one milk. Is that right, Bob? I know it's right because I had the conversation with him. So we were thinking and discussing in the difference of two dollars a hundredweight on milk. Now keep in mind, this organization did not have a program to raise the price necessarily on class one milk. It's to raise the price to farmers for their milk, their hogs, their grain, and everything else. And bring it all up. Now let's see what happened. Would you turn the lights down up here, please? Steve Pavich from Wisconsin called me one day and he said, I've got something to me seems pretty important. He said, I want to relay it to you. You don't just like to take the word of somebody even though you know it's factual because somebody says, I don't believe it. So if somebody don't believe it, let's take a look at the Wisconsin State Reporter, dated July 1978. But Steve called in and he said, Ed, guess what? He said, here's the report, the Wisconsin Farm Reporter from the Wisconsin Agricultural Reporting Service. And he says, for all milk, all milk this month in the state of Wisconsin, Minnesota, Iowa, New York, Pennsylvania, and California with the listed prices. He said it's 984 in Wisconsin, 948 in Minnesota, 975 in Iowa, 970 in Was New York, and 960 in California. But he said, I read the one the month before, and they project, projected that Wisconsin would get 30 cents a hundred more for all of the milk they, they produced than would the state of California. Let me give you some history. All the leaders had always told me as a producer, and that's why there's thousands of them not on the farm up there, you can't get a price because of this. Population in Wisconsin. Move it over a little more. Four and a half million people in Wisconsin and 20 million people to eat all that milk, and dairy products. So that's why you can't get a fair price in Wisconsin. We went down the line and we looked at the production. 
They said, well, here's the reason. 21 billion pounds you produce a year in Wisconsin, and you see California only has 11.9 billion, and 20 million people eat it up. But there's that same old story, you know. It isn't the price, they said, on all the milk. It's that you got to get her into the bottle. That's where the money is. Well, Wisconsin utilizes 25 to 30 percent of their production in the bottle. California, 60 to 65 percent, and I'm being conservative. And then this one. You poor farmers, if you just advertise, if you just give us the money to advertise and, and get everybody to eat, Wisconsin was blacklisted because they voted her down. They got nothing for advertising on the dairy checkoff. They told them in California, advertise, advertise. So they had six cents a hundred, but they went to ten cents a hundred. The price in June officially $9.84 per hundredweight for all the milk in Wisconsin, $9.60 for the milk in California, which is 24 cents a hundred weight more, but why? We tried some time ago, and California, we're coming back, to put a block of milk together to make them pay more, and in 1973 and 74, we got driven right out of the state of California but we had strength enough to fight it in Wisconsin because that month there was at least 60 million pounds in that area went through the NFO and there was nothing went through in California. 24 cents a hundred on 21 billion pounds of milk. My friends, I can't go back and show you the records of the $2 behind the market, but I'm not too sure we're talking of 24 cents a hundred. We could be talking of $2.24 a hundred. By some action by farmers, remember 487 turned it around on a given day. And the Wisconsin Agricultural Reporting Service quotes those figures. It's factual. Do you have any confidence now to go out and say that this organization can put the general price level up? If that isn't what did it, what else did it? That's a sobering thought, isn't it? Those figures are available from the Wisconsin Reporting Service. It's production that farmers have, I believe, in this audience that still isn't with us. But I'll tell you, I'd rather have that price today of an average of 1050 which it is today, than I wanted back when we started, when Bob Mankey was getting $3.87 a hundred for his milk. And today, I like to see farmers that are organized and put their production through NFO, get the top price and bring the price up in their state. That's very rewarding, not just to me, but to you and to the farmer that doesn't understand. So, in conclusion, you don't have to worry about the inspections on your farm, as the gentleman did this morning. You don't have to worry about wanting more or less exports or imports. You really don't have to worry about more or less competition. You don't even have to worry about more or less trips to Washington, D.C. There's only one thing you need to worry about, and that's in the next couple of weeks until March 1st, when we put that 30% of production together. Thank you.
Could we have the lights back up, please? As we prepare to conclude our convention for this year, we want to remind you the theme of farm power that's carried through. And as we begin to conclude, we'd like to stress that again, and your national president has a message now to give us some instructions on how to follow through and make the theme of farm power become a reality. Your national president, Orrin Lee Staley. Well, at least you got to stretch for a moment. Now let's get down to real serious business. I said the other night, Wednesday night, that this was a convention I had waited for and worked for for 23 years. And as we prepare to leave this convention, with many having already gone, but still a great crowd here. I'm more convinced now, and I hope you are, that we have the capabilities to finish up the job and get farmers in a position to price their products. You have seen the department reports, you have seen their capabilities, and you are experiencing their capabilities. I hope that if you have not signed the pledge of each one get five more, that you at least, and we have a lot of them, that you'll live up to it. There are a few jobs that have to be done. One is a pledge on getting the production. Each one of you get five more. And that means that to do it systematically, you should pick the commodity that in your county and in your area that's the most successful to build on. Because that only makes good sense, doesn't it? If all of them are working satisfactorily, then you can take days to do certain things on certain commodities. But it'll pretty well take care of itself because you each produce different commodities where it's a diversified area. So that means when you pledge, I assume that you pledge, five others, either members or not members, that produce the same commodities that you produce. And that, that in itself will apply to all the commodities. You know enough about the programs, the collection points, where they are. If necessary, contact the departments to reactivate any that might need to be reactivated. That in putting on milk, you have to put it together so there's short hauling distance for pickup on the farm. That we need you to take care of the dues instead of having to pay the staff. Assign somebody or some people to certificate of support and offering the best bargain that members that got behind on their dues could possibly have, but those that are $225 and over for $75 can have those dues forgiven. We have to go at some point, though, to keep the cash flow going, and the reason for raising to two and a quarter over 150 is that some people indicated last year they were going to wait a little while and save a, 
150 because they were just about in the right position to do that. We heard a few of those. And so that was the reason that the board made that decision. I think we all recognize that the young farmers do have their backs to the wall. And I think that we understand that we're too busy through the rest of the year to do anything other than take care of our own farming operation. But I talked about the 20, year, 20 years ago, or last 23 years, but really 20. And you compare the time that it's taken us to build this organization compared to uh, the major corporations or labor or anybody else, we've done very well. Not as fast as I would have liked to have seen it. But standing here today, we know it's not going to come from Washington, D.C. We know, on the other hand, the pressure against inflation is going to be directed at farmers because they're unorganized. And there's not a plan and even a thought, let alone a nationwide structure from coast to coast. The people here from Maine to California over here, and I'll bet you in California thought about the dairy there, the impression that I'm sure that made. from the Gulf of Mexico to the Canadian line, still in this auditorium. But there's nobody that has a plan, let alone a structure with capable people trained within the organization and the addition of professionals that can say to the farmers of this nation, you even have a chance of getting the cost of production plus a reasonable profit by the first day of March. We're the only ones, aren't we? Now the question comes, the structure is there, and almost without exception, our members are getting the best prices available to farmers. And where there are those few exceptions, they're because we need more volume which can get us better outlets and in some cases, the right outlets. I'm going to try to take just a few moments, rather than to speak any longer, to give you a helpful hint. And I'd like for about seven of the young farmers, and really, would you put a table over here and move the chairs over here, would you all? Some of you move the chairs so that the audience, that I can see the audience. And I'm going to try to give you a demonstration of what I've used many times. There were many people in this country thought we got a lot of members when we got 1,000, 2,000 people out to the meetings. I can tell you I was never good enough and for my knowledge that I remember to get more than 10 members in any one of those meetings where maybe we had 1,000, 1,500 non-members out. And I can tell you how the organization was organized from the beginning of the collective bargaining program. And I've always hesitated to use this publicly, but we're using it as we put the young farmer structure together, which we're going to back up all the other structures with a young farmer over every two counties and then broken down for coordination in or build in, rather. I guess I could say you could go either way that you absolutely can do it without talking much. And I'll give in a few minutes time, and I'd just like for eight young farmers, 35 and under, to come on up here, would you? Quick, please. Come on up, eight of you. Some of you are here on the front row, come on up. That's fine. Come on, four. Here comes the fifth one. There comes one on over yonder. 
Now the first thing I'm going to do is because of the audience, I want to turn the other way where I can face the audience. Turn the table the other way. And while I'm here on the individual contact, Devon, why don't you be the guinea pig here for a moment? The first thing on individual contact I want on is the farm power button. Now, what do I want? You can get them before you leave. And I'll tell you, this is going to be Devon. I'm sure he's going to be very difficult, you know. But I walk up to him and say, glad to be on your farm, Mr. Whitlock. Glad to have you, Mr. Staley. I'd like to take a few minutes to tell you about the new National Farmers Organization. I'll, I have a few minutes. The NFO has made a lot of changes in the last few months, particularly within the last year. And we have added many professional people to our staff which has brought us into a position to improve our prices so that there's a great improvement over what it was even a year ago. We had a meeting in Des Moines, Iowa, and if he hadn't seen it, he'll start looking at this. And I just say we had a meeting in Des Moines, Iowa on August 3rd in which 10,000 people attended and we voted there to increase our volume by 50% by the 1st of September, which we reached, and to go into our national convention and by March 1st, moving day in agriculture, put together 30% of the production of this country so that we could get cost of production plus reasonable profit contracts. And then I asked him a question. And this is where you go off the defensive. You know, one thing you've got to learn, you don't learn much when you're talking. And if you try to talk too much, you know, he may have two things he wants to know about, and I may spend an hour like we have in the past and talk about a hundred things, and what have I got? I might not even have covered his two things, that he had in his mind, but I've added 98 more to them if I did, and he's utterly confused the way we've been talking to. And you do it with a very low key. You know, we have gotten to the point that we, in working out with the farmers, that we be have become antagonistic to a lot of farmers because we went in there with an attitude that showed through that we've got to get every one of them. And so we just go in there with a full load and we hang on until we become antagonistic because we're trying too hard. So you go to low key, and then I just say to him, what do you think, Mr. Woodland? Yeah, I think, uh, I think farmers uh, need to organize. They're an independent lot. Uh, I don't know if it'll ever get done. Uh, it never has, and maybe it will someday. You think it should? Yeah, I think that it should. I yeah. think it should happen. Well, what do you think it takes to do? Well, first thing, they've got to think alike. Um... Uh, and I'd suppose that their power would be in farm production. <laughs> and I'm going to try it on people I've never met here, most of them. And the reason I'm going to try it, now what am I going to do? I haven't committed myself a bit. Do you follow what I'm saying? And I've gotten it down quick, and all I did is want to get that. I would ask a question, but I'm going to show here, or try to, and I will want that in, if you can come down here, please. Okay. 
Well, I don't, now I'm going to change right here. Not that I care about myself, but I don't want somebody sitting right by me. So I'd want to change him right off, move down this way. Yes, please. And I'll tell you why in a moment. The setting is very important. You do not want a big table with a soft chair somewhere that's too soft. They get too comfortable. Now, I'm going to try, and these, I don't know any of them. I brought them from the audience, and I'll tell you why as we go around. It won't take very long. Of course, I would have introduced myself, and I was shaking each one of their hands, not knowing them. But let's start over here with this microphone so we can visit. Do you think farmers should organize? Yes, I do. Well, why do you say that? Well, I, uh, as far as being out here by yourself, you ain't got a chance. Is selling on your, as far as selling uh, production and whatnot by yourself, they've, they've got you. Do you think farmers should organize? Yes. Why do you say that? Well, I've sold too many. Well, I, I sold too many head of livestock at a auction barn by myself, and got literally ripped by them. And uh, I just won't go through that again. And I think everyone should realize that. Do you think farmers should organize? Yes, I do. Why do you say that? Well, I guess I'm sick and tired of spending a lot of money on production costs and not really knowing what I'm going to get when I sell my products. Do you think farmers should organize? Yes, I do. Why do you say that? Because I've seen too many people uh, take their animals and livestock and not get nothing for them. Do you think farmers should organize? Yes, I do. Why do you say that? Uh, I think it's a matter of you need the uh, agriculture economy to be healthy in order for the entire economy to be healthy. And up to now, since we don't have the, haven't been able to price our own product, we haven't been able to keep the agriculture economy healthy. Do you think farmers should organize? No. Why do you say that? Well, if you, if you can't manage your farm and run it properly by yourself, how can anybody else help you? Well, I guess that's always a problem, and uh, everybody could look at it that way. Uh, uh, do you feel that the farmer is at any disadvantage uh, selling as one individual where four or five large companies will buy, own, control 50 to 70 percent of the total production? Well, I, I feel that's a myth. Uh, if I do a good job raising my cattle, have good cattle, I feel that I can bargain with a person get a fair price myself. You think you can make it on your own? Uh, Certainly. Okay, thank you. And next, uh, do you feel farmers should organize? Yes, I do. Why do you say that? Well, if they don't, that all the younger people in this country won't be able to farm, and I've enjoyed farming. I suppose everybody else would like to, too. So that's why I feel. All right, the next, do you think farmers should organize? Yes, I do. Why do you say that? Because I feel an individual has never any, has, doesn't have enough bargaining power by himself. Would you explain that a little more, maybe? Well, an individual person cannot go to the marketplace and by himself and demand a price, but where you get in a group like the Farmer, National Farmers Organization, you have enough power where you can ask what you please. Do you think farmers should organize? Yes, I do. Why do you say that? Because in this economy, everybody else is organized. And we can't do anything alone because we sell to the whole group as a whole. Do you think farmers should organize? Yes, I do. But I've been waiting for somebody to come around to my farm and tell me what to do about it. Yeah. All right, less than, less than all of us discussed for a little minute, uh, for a moment, where, what is farmers' strength? Where, where do they really have their strength? Well, on my particular farm, it's the milk in the tank. Yeah. I can have fieldmen from three or four different plants stop in and say, I want your milk. All right, but we're, if 
if we've got a problem in agriculture, and we agree we have, then there must be some strength somewhere on the other side that's keeping us from getting equity or fairness. Wouldn't that make sense? Yes. And if there's strength on the other side, we should analyze that strength, and then we should uh, see where our strength is, shouldn't we? Mm-hmm. Uh, do you think that we've got strength in Washington with 3% with of the vote? Not on that front, we don't. Okay, let's, um, where do you think farmer's strength really is? It's in their production if they organize it and block it together. What do the rest of you think? You think it's in their production, uh, farmer's strength's in the production? Why would you say that? Why do you think we've got our strength in our production? All right, let's, here's two answers here. Both of you give your answers. What I said was we have something that nobody else has, whereas... Uh, what did you say? That's about what I said. We got it and we have it first, so we ought to demand what we want it and then let those guys have whatever they want charge after that. And if they want to raise their prices, well, we'll just raise ours up a little bit more too. Right. Just as long as we can make it with a fair price. How, uh, how large an area do you think we have to cover if we're, going to, if we're going to have strength? What part of the United States? Uh... Oh, well, I would say we need to cover kind of all of it. I mean, you know, cover the whole general territory and get quite a bit of the percentage up, about 30 percent, and I think we could probably handle it. Why would you say that? What do some of the rest of you think? Why would it have to be all over the country? Here, he's got an idea there. Well, if you're strong in one area and not in another, you're going to leave yourself open to movement of the production from a high price area, or no, from a low price area into a high price area and beat your, you know, beat yourself your own uh, game, sort of. So you need uh, the whole area covered so they can't, you know, get you in one area. If the strength is in our production, then what do we have to do with our production? Is it united? Well, we have a way to do that, and that's where I would conclude. Now, the reason I want to tell you a few things, I'm glad the gentleman down here took the opposite position. I'm not going to argue with him Immediately, I knew more about, and I've never really gotten acquainted with the, any of the, the people here, but I know something about each one of them right here. And pretty soon, he would have been awful lonesome in this particular crowd because seven, he, he would have been outnumbered, you see. But that, the important part is, all I was doing was asking the questions to lead to obvious conclusions. One. The farmers need to organize. Second, they need their strength is in their production. And third, that it has to be united. And the fourth is getting them down to the point that they were there. And I would have had some new membership agreements laying out here on the corner, but never have mentioned them. But what you're talking about here is developing a consensus of agreement. And when you develop a consensus of agreement, among them, then you can get action as a group in all likelihood. And how, I'll bet you in the audience, uh, here in the auditorium, were surprised. Everybody, I'll bet you, thought, uh oh, everybody's going to say yes. Farmers should organize. But when I asked, why do you say that, every one of you had to think for an answer, didn't you? And some have told me in meetings like this, for heaven's sakes, don't start with me next time first. Go the other way around on the next question. Because you can just see the pressure build as everybody has to think. Now, I'm not going to argue with somebody and suppose that three or four of them agreed it ought to be done and the, and the others were not, because I'm going to know a little more. Then I'm going to adjourn it pretty early, but ask the three or four very quietly, I'd like to stay and talk to you. I'd like for you to stay a moment and talk to you. 
so I get it down to where three or four interested people can discuss it without somebody antagonistically tearing it up. And that's all. I just thought you'd like to. I've, I've been very successful with it, and I think any of you can do this if you just remember about three questions. And turn tape over to, please turn tape over to side number two.